Well, hey, y'all. Welcome back to the podcast. Joseph, uh, host, pastor, uh, other things involved in this life of ministry and community, but I'm delighted to have you back here on the podcast. Delighted to welcome our guest, uh, the one and only Carl Craig. Welcome, Carl. Thanks for having me. Now, Carl, you're in charge of all the buildings and grounds, and you, along with Dwight Howard, as I tell people, are the people who make things happen. <laughs> when you need something, uh, text to call, Carl's there. Uh, between you and Dwight, I think all the systems of our church happen and run uh, between the AC mm-hmm. and the chairs getting set up and all the stuff in between. Mm-hmm. And it makes a huge difference mm-hmm. <laughs> for us as a church. Um, and before we get into some of that, I do want to start off by just uh, starting off with what this podcast is about. This season, this summer, is all about Oak Grove and the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, when I think about Oak Grove, I think more about not just the church itself, the physical plant, but also the neighborhood and our connection as a, as a body of Christ in the area. Uh, now, as a reminder, the vision statement for Oak Grove is that our vision is to build inclusive, life-changing communities and experience transformation in Jesus Christ. We do that by these three ways of connecting with each other, growing in our faith, and living out our faith in the world. And one of the ways we do that is by having an actual building and grounds. And and Carl is said, responsible for many things. In the old language, it was a church sextant, the one who cared for the property and the people and made all the things happen then. But uh, yeah, so we'll start off. The question we ask every guest I'm going to ask Carl is, so to, who are you and how did you get here? Well, I consider myself the caretaker, and I've always okay. thought about caretaker. Mm-hmm. I have been here uh, for 30 years this October. I've lived on the property with my family for 29 years or so. Okay. Um, 1994, mid-94, I started a cleaning company. Uh, I had a friend, an acquaintance, who also had a cleaning company, and he said one day, he said, you know, um, I have this little teeny account down in Decatur, and I can't get to it. Hmm. Can you help me out? Hmm. I said, yeah, I think I can get to it. So, it was actually the YCS, and we would go into YCS, <laughs> which had about 60 kids at the, at the time. Okay. And I would clean it with a crew. And after about a month of that, the care, or the uh, administrator of the church at the time, Doug people say, you know, we really want to know who's in the building tonight. Would you come up and meet me? Hmm. So, I uh, made an appointment with him on a Monday morning <laughs> okay. and pulled into the parking lot and met him. And yeah. and he offered me a job there. And he said, would you like to work four hours a day? Can you spare four hours? And I said, sure. Okay. So, that's how it all began. That's how it all began. In 94. Now, what were the Braves doing at that point? They, <laughs> they had yet to win a World Series. Okay. It was starting to get frustrating. But it was coming. It was coming. <laughs> so, that's right. Uh, well, if you don't know already, Carl is a big Braves fan. Mm-hmm. And we'll chat some more about that later. And on, that was sure. a strike year. I think 94, was, 94, 94 was the year we didn't have a World Series. Yeah. That was, uh, I was a kid then. And I oh, was yeah. very upset that they wanted more money. Mm-hmm. I understood it somewhat, but I was still a little bit miffed. I didn't get to. Uh, and it was all Tom Glavin's fault. Some was people it? still say. Oh, the ace. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, more about that. And so, uh, okay, so you flash forward to you and your wife, Kim, mm-hmm. and starting a family and some of that. Mm-hmm. Tell us more about that. Well, I'll tell you, the first place, we got married in 96. So, I lived here for a year and a half or so by myself. And if everybody remembers, there's a little white house up on the top of the hill of Fair Oaks. Mm-hmm. Now, that was the original parsonage of the church built in 1935. Okay. And it was moved up on top of the hill to make room to build the current YCS building. Okay. And that's the Young Children's School just that is down the, young the hill. School. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that house built by church volunteers was moved on top of the hill and set on cinder blocks. Awesome. So, this was our first house when we were married, and it was teeny tiny. Oh, and by the way, it's the house that Carol Bates grew up in. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, Becky Lee talked about her oh, in the she did? podcast earlier and her dad being a prolific writer mm-hmm. and, and theologian. So, yeah, that, that's hilarious. So, I... I I asked, you know, I knew I was going to marry Kim, and I said, would you move into this house when I moved in there? And I'll tell you, it was something. She goes, I think we could make a go of it. It would yeah. it would be fun. It was interesting. But we loved living there. We lived there for seven years. Okay. And it was time. We, we were, Kim and I wanted to have children. Mm. So, we approached the administrator at the time, which was Reverend Lewis Miller. He was oh, yeah. in a temporary, <laughs> temporary job and said, hey, could, could we move around the corner into Aunt Thelma's house? So, he made that happen. Okay. Well, Lewis Miller, uh, who is delightful and lovely and awesome, uh, someone many of us know here at the church, one of the first deacons in the Amethyst Church. Okay. And so, somebody I 
uh, pattern myself after. He's been mentioned in other parts of the podcast. Uh, in the first episode, when Pastor Amy was talking about coming here and learning from the current person who was doing missions at the time, who was Lewis Miller. <laughs> He's made his rounds around here. So, Kim and I have been in that house since 2002. Okay, all right. So, 2002, and that's the house just up the street. That's uh, right, yeah, corner of yeah. Crestline and Oak Grove. Yeah. Which right. is the edge, northern edge of our property. Sure, sure. And I think a lot of people uh, might know where that is, but there's also been a lot of changes in our area, just in, even in my time here, mm-hmm. uh, with the new building construction, uh, finished and started in 2013, 2014, mm-hmm. 15, and then finishing actually out this office where we are now in the summer of 2017, uh, or that, 20, oh, that's 2018. Right. That's yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. After I had been here, I've been here for seven years now. Ah. So, not 30 years, but it's seven. We'll, we'll take it. <laughs> so, okay. So, starting a family and doing all that. And do you want to tell us some about your family or about your kids? Fine. Sure. My children are 20 and 18. Uh, my eldest is uh, my son, Alex. He is a junior at University of Georgia. Okay. And my daughter, Emma Lynn, is just graduated from Greater Atlanta Christian, and she will be attending uh, Georgia College in Milledgeville starting this fall. So, Kim and I are empty nesters. Yeah, the grown and flown. Yeah. Yeah, or however you might say that. Um, there's a lot of that going around these days. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, I know, uh, and, and Kim works down the way. Yeah, that's uh, right. She um, she works at Queenie's, yeah, yeah. and it's always interesting. There are She's been there for, I think, about 10 years, and there's okay. so many people that know her. And know me, but they don't know we're married. <laughs> don't know y'all and go together. These, yeah, that's right. And yeah. they have these, we have these times when we see them out for dinner and they're like, what are you guys doing together? <laughs> that's hilarious. And we see Sharna and her sister and, that's right. and, and your wife. It's sort of like, they could all be sisters. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, uh, Queenie's consignment, delightful, fun people we've known for a long time. Uh, well, that's cool now. Okay. So, you've had many, many, I'm sure... Odd and fun things you've gotten to do here as far as the building and grounds, mm-hmm. uh, but also as the buildings have changed over the years, mm-hmm. I'm sure the complexity has somewhat elevated mm-hmm. uh, for you and also for Dwight Howard, who works in our building. Absolutely. Well. Yeah. Now, now, Dwight's been working with you for a long time. He's been here since 2008. Okay. Okay. Well, that's more than a minute mm-hmm. and uh, almost half your time. That's right. <laughs> so I think it was half my time. I calculated the other day. I okay. Like well, that's nice to have that be a midpoint. When I first got here, a um, lot of seniors here, and I know you remember Ina Mae Jones, or yeah. you know oh, yeah. the name. She passed away in 2000. Yeah. She was the matriarch of the church. Yeah. So, when I started, this is before cell phones. Mm. So, when I got here, I was handed by the administrator a pager. And quirky thing about it, I would get a page. I said, why do I have a pager? So, well, this is what you're going to do. Ina Mae, during the week, likes to go visiting. She likes to go see family members. She likes Mm -hmm. to go see church members. And she cannot drive her car in reverse. So, I'm going to send you an address (laughs) on this pager. And you got to get in a church van. And you got to go find Ina Mae, back her car out in reverse, put it forward, and then she can get in and drive to the next visit. So, a lot of my job the first couple (laughs) years was basically being a valet, I think. Yeah. Well, that I would get a text. Go to Kingsbridge, go find Ina May, move her car forward, and she'd go on. <laughs> I'm laughing because in seminary, uh, for us who go through uh, theology training, all of that, but any anyone's work, there are always things that pop up. You're like, well, I didn't go to school for this. Or, oh, absolutely. I, this was not in the job description. And so, the joke is, in any associate pastor's uh, job title is, and other duties as assigned. <laughs> and that's pretty much. That is open. Uh, that is, a, I think, a part of all of our jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, pastor Glenn Etheridge would say to me, uh, I would see him uh, as our pastor emeritus who uh, passed away four years ago from cancer, a delightful human, but also would I'd see him picking up trash in the parking lot walking from his car. Absolutely. And he would just say, well, there's no job too big or small that's not worth mm-hmm. doing. And I think that that sort of understanding of mm-hmm. an appreciation for any of those tasks is really important. Absolutely. And yeah. you know what? It's, it, it ends up not being drudgery. Mm-hmm. I will tell you that that. What I got in return from that was just a feeling of family. Mm. I was just so invited once I lived here. Oh, yeah. Once I got married, once I had children, there was no way to leave. It was the best place to raise children on the planet. Yeah. And, and we'll talk some more about the demographics of the neighborhood and some mm-hmm. of that. Uh, but first, I want to get into sort of a little bit about the physical plant, uh, the mm-hmm. building and grounds. And so... Uh, my dad was a trustee of a church, and he used to like to go and ask people, well, how many toilets are there in the building? <laughs> and that was always one of mm-hmm. his favorite questions. Mm-hmm. But uh, everything between uh, the boilers and mm-hmm. the buildings, 
and air conditioning systems, all these things are sort of under your purview. Absolutely. Um, and so there's yearly and I'm sure quarterly sort of check-ins on those systems. Oh, absolutely. Yearly, quarterly. We deal with state agencies. We deal with county agencies. I don't know how many toilets are in the building. I'm sorry. But I do <laughs> sure, know there sure. are 136 air conditioning units. 136. 136. fan coils indoors. Wow. So um, something is always breaking. Someone's <laughs> always warm. Someone's always cold at the same time. Someone's sure. always a little... Unhappy. Oh well, sure, sure. And again, you know what? What would it be if there weren't an air conditioning challenge? But of 136 units, that's that, right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we're changing the filters and things, that makes sense. Why it takes more than a couple of days? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, it is funny, but when you think about, uh, we do this in our sort of announcing the offering each Sunday in worship. We mm -hmm. talk about uh, we have a moment of gratitude and helping people understand what when they give to the church what it does. Mm -hmm. um, so our building and grounds are a huge part of our ministry for the church, but also uh, paying our staff people mm -hmm. uh, and paying for materials and things we need to make ministry happen and to provide a, a thoughtful and good space. That includes air conditioning, and we're grateful for that, especially in July mm -hmm. <laughs> when it gets so hot in August. Uh, but it really does take not just having those systems, but maintaining them well. Right. Uh, because when you do that, things last longer, you're a better steward of those financial gifts from people, but it also reminds us how when anyone gives to the church, we're all supporting this work together. Now, spaces and events are one of the things that we love about this church. Uh, we're not a church that just operates on Sunday morning only. Oh, absolutely uh, not. We're a church that pretty much any day of the week you might look, uh, especially in the fall and spring, mm -hmm. uh, in December and May. Imagine those are some mm -hmm. of our busier months. But uh, tell people kind of some of the general events that happen here or what maybe a typical week in the fall might look like. Well, I'll tell you, here in July, this yeah. is our really only quiet month. Sure. But starting August 1st, we're going to get into a routine and we'll go all the way to through May. Yeah. And that routine is based on church on Sunday. Sure. And then turning the whole building over to make it look decent by Wednesday for midweek. And sure. then once midweek's open... Thursday and Friday, get it turned back over for church again. Now, in between there, we have a whole lot of events. We have yeah. senior events in Fellowship Hall. We uh, pack food every Thursday. Yeah, every Fellowship Thursday. Hall, delivered on Friday. We have outdoor, outside groups that come in, non-church affiliated groups that come sure. in, and we invite them into the building, and they love it. Yeah. So, but basically, that is the routine. It goes from church to midweek. Back to church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so the fellowship hall is changed over every single week, uh, twice. Mm -hmm, twice. <laughs> to, uh, to go from Sunday, 1045 modern worship, to then get all that taken down, cleaned. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tuesday lunch bunch that might be happening month, for our yeah. senior adults once a month. Mm -hmm. And then Wednesday night for midweek dinner, which if you don't know about midweek dinners, uh, for any of us with young children or anybody who likes to eat a meal you didn't have to cook or clean. That's everybody. Uh, for like I said, for that price, you can come and be a part of this midweek dinner where we have delightful home cooking from Chef Allison, and then we have programming and events for adults mm -hmm. and kids after that, and children and children's choirs as well. Uh, and that's on 5, 5 to 6 p.m. every mm -hmm. Wednesday during the school year. We and then communion service in Grand Hall at 5 o'clock. And the communion service, which you also have to turn over mm -hmm. Grand Hall many times in a week uh, to get it ready for anything from funerals to wedding receptions to any sort of events, uh, Boy Scout things. The district loves to use it. Yeah, our, our North Georgia Conference, the district, mm -hmm. Central South, loves to use our space because it's beautiful. We Conference do, loves to use we it. We do a good job setting stuff up. The North Georgia Conference, which is located not far from here, uh, does love using that's right space yeah, yeah yeah so so you see how it just happens where the space is not just sitting <laughs> static um the old joke is that ministers only work one hour a week on sunday morning anyway mm -hmm. so what else are you going to do that's right uh, you know when i first took this job i thought well yeah you work a few hours on sunday and then you close the rest of the week <laughs> so now we're laughing about that mm -hmm. uh one of the first weeks i was uh here working uh, probably six and a half years ago it was in the summer maybe uh, just at the start of school, I was coming up to get something from my office, and I was walking out, and I turned around the corner and saw a little fluffy dog. Mm -hmm. and it nearly scared the junk out of me, and it really? was you. With, oh, it was with your little dog <laughs> walking the halls and locking up. Uh, so the hours, you know, for anybody working in a church setting, might be a little different, mm -hmm. uh, but for you especially, they're sometimes very early mm -hmm. and sometimes very late. Yeah, part of my duties are locking up the building every night, and that has always been a family affair. Oh, yeah. uh, me, the kids, I can remember strapped in baby Bjorn's, keys in hand, <laughs> um, dogs, cats, whatever we had, we'd make the rounds through the building. Yeah, and I've, like I said, I enjoy getting to see you and and the animals. That's right, that's right. Uh, making the rounds. Um, it was funny that, the, you know, we did this, 
with the kids and they thought this was their house, the whole building. Mm. And I took Alex to um, Easter Sunday service, I think when he was five. And he said, what are these people doing here? Because there's people, not there's just people chairs. in the building, not <laughs> yeah. just chairs, yeah. and and yeah. we didn't lock any doors, so he was very surprised. That's funny. Well, uh, I, I being a pastor who has two kids, uh, they've sort of grow up in the church at odd hours as well. Mm-hmm. Um, early in the morning, my four year old uh, coming with me, or my ten year old, and walking around, and it's just sort of a you get a different experience of it when your parent works. Somewhere. Absolutely, um, it can be both positive and negative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Um, but again, it's good to have that flexibility in our work that allows us to be present with our families. Mm-hmm. You know, that was something you and I have talked about, that being really important for you and for your life. I'm grateful that my job allows me to be flexible, to be present with my family mm-hmm. and do the things I need to do as a dad. Mm-hmm. And I know you've had some similar experiences with that. Uh, well, I, I, I don't think I would, Joseph, I don't think I would have been here for 30 years if I was not allowed to be here with my family. Yeah. It's just made things wonderful. Well, and I think when we think about Oak Grove mm-hmm. and what are both church and neighborhood, some of those similar mm-hmm. values, the importance of family, the ability to be present with our families, mm-hmm. uh, to have meaningful work that remunerates us in a way mm-hmm. we can afford to do things and allows us to be present. And look, I've walked to work every day. That's I've true. never missed a baseball game. I've never missed a softball game. I've never missed yeah. a track meet. So I got to be a good dad. And anybody, by the way, who drove on the, through the corner of Crestline and uh, Oak Grove probably saw me throwing a baseball every afternoon with my son. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I know you're also uh, big into uh, barbecuing. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, uh, one of your one of your grills I've seen out back is an old boiler. That is the uh, expansion tank from our old boiler when we were doing <laughs> renovation in 2016. Yeah. Uh, the plumbers came in. We we got a new boiler. Yeah. Plumbers came in and started to remove the expansion tank. It's 500 gallon. Wow. And I thought, oh, I want that. Yeah. So they dropped it in the back of my pickup truck, and I took it home. And a buddy <laughs> my wel- buddy of mine welded a frame together, and we cut it open. Okay. And now that is our smoker. <laughs> so it's a rather large 500 gallon smoker. It is. And if anybody wants to come by, I am happy to show them pictures. Yeah. Or give them a tour of my house, and we'll cook something on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, one of my, uh, the opening events for me as a new pastor here for the staff was you, you smoked salmon. Yeah, that's was right. That's delicious. Right. So, uh, now tell me the name of your actual group of folks you smoke things with. Do you have a team or competitive group? I just have, I, I just have a group of guys that I am very, very simpatico with, but all of our children are the same age. We yeah, all yeah. grew up playing baseball, we coach baseball, and we all like to just cook and hang out. So. Yeah. Well, that's important. I, I think when you think about how family and intergenerational things work so well for our church or neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a huge part of of what makes ministry at Oak Grove meaningful and good and different than a lot of places. Um, Now, uh, share a little bit about how doing these things is not just simply moving tables and chairs and drudgery, but how it's ministry and how it helps any of us who are pastors or staff coming in for our event really be set up and ready to succeed. Well, I hope after 30 years, I'm intuitive enough to know what you need when you need it. And my job is to have a room set up for you, cooled for you, uh, a vehicle ready for you to take off, anticipate your needs so you don't have to worry about it. You can just come in, perform ministry as best you can. Well, you saved my bacon a number of times on the Easter sunrise service. Oh, (laughs) that's right. And that one comes early. Oh, boy, does it. So, we're doing the sunrise service, and I'm a musician. I'll be like, Carl, we need about 20 chairs out there. And I'll show up. uh, (laughs) Right. And the chairs are out there, and they're ready, and uh, you're just a delight to work with. And it's a... it makes ministry so much easier when you have that great relationship between your building and grounds world, mm-hmm. the caretaking folks who really do care not just for the space, but for the people. Absolutely. And the commute is easy. So yeah. I don't mind doing any of it. <laughs> Especially early. That's right. <laughs> Well, Carl, I know uh, it's, it will be close to 30 years in October, mm-hmm. uh, near Barbecue Weekend, and you uh, will have seen a lot of changes in our neighborhood and in the church over the years. Mm-hmm. And so, I want to just, some, what are some of those specific and general things you've seen change about the neighborhood and about the church, maybe about the people who live here as well? Hey, the day I moved into that little house on the hill up on Fair Oaks, that little white house, my neighbor, Phil Saris, across the street, who's a member of the Greek Orthodox Church, yeah. introduced himself, came over, and he said, you know how a lot of old people move to Florida to retire? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, their parents live here. (laughs) 
And and yeah. he wasn't kidding. It was really an old group. And I'll tell you, the first few years of a big portion of what we did was actually help our seniors move out of their homes mm. and into places like Kingsbridge, Claremont Place. Um, I can remember uh, helping the Kimbros move out specifically mm. and and moving all their furniture and and we would we would help them get rid of the stuff they needed help get rid of help mm. them move into Kingsbridge and um, you know there weren't a lot of kids here when I first started as I mentioned that mm. the YCS or Young Children's School I think I had sixty kids our daycare okay. also had fifty sixty kids we we didn't have a vacation Bible school oh wow we had a small children's ministry. And then 10 years later, by the time my kids were born, it, w- it was incredible. The whole neighborhood had turned over. <laughs> wow. Okay. And so, so our younger families were moving in. Younger families homes. were moving in. We saw yeah. all these big houses build up. Okay. And uh, next thing you know, we had 250 kids in daycare. We had 250 wow. kids and a waiting list in YCS bursting wow. at the seams. Yeah. And I, what, two, 300 at uh, um, Vacation Bible School. Yeah, and so again, those numbers always sort of any any neighborhood you have this sort of right. uh, growth and shrink of numbers of populations, mm-hmm. uh, and so over the years that has changed some. You know, our uh, United but, Methodist yeah. women, when they were United Methodist women, yeah, they yeah. held a new baby celebration every year. Ah. We'd have twenty five, thirty, thirty five l- babies every spring, yeah. and we'd have a social. So. Yeah, a little different now. A little different. Uh, now, we still have lots of kids and, and neighborhood folks having kids. Mm-hmm. And also, there are some other sort of options for child care in the neighborhood. As If anybody has a, <laughs> I'm a, we're adoptive parents. And when we <laughs> adopted our uh, two-year-old at the time, uh, who's now four, um, we were looking for child care options. And we had to, we were thankful to find one here at the church. Mm-hmm. But it is really challenging to try and figure out where to get your kids and how to have them have good and meaningful care, but also somewhere nearby and somewhat affordably. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there are definitely options around, but also it can be pretty challenging to figure that out. Mm-hmm. Um, so your kids went all the way through elementary school nearby? or They uh, went to, yeah. uh, both my kids went to Oak Grove Elementary. Mm-hmm. Um, my daughter went to a private school starting in fifth grade. Sure. My son went through um, Henderson Middle, yeah, yeah. and then they both went to Greater Northern Christian in high school. Okay, nice, nice. And we have lots of our youth and uh, children who go to all these different schools we have around. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there are a lot more options maybe now <laughs> around the area than there might have been uh, in Absolutely. previous generations. Yeah. Well, and, and anytime you get um, the demographics and neighborhood changes as far as who's moving into our neighborhood, I, I share this often with people who are joining the church, that the people joining our church and who are also moving the neighborhood are people who have two incomes, so they can afford to live here because mm-hmm. it's gotten more expensive to live in the area mm-hmm. over the past 10 years, 20 years. Uh, but then they also have uh, a fewer numbers of kids if both spouses are working typically. Mm-hmm. That's sort of how the demographic trends go, not just here in our neighborhood, but across uh, for people like me, who's an elder millennial, uh, but then also for people who are younger than me and who are moving in. The second gen, uh, sort of demographic of folks moving into the neighborhood are grandparents who are downsizing mm-hmm. <laughs> and wanting to be closer to those grandkids um, or who are moving into those uh, retirement communities that we know and love and have buses that you help make happen. Absolutely. Uh, to go and get them and bring them for worship and events and that part of things. Mm-hmm. So it's a really interesting thing to sort of see the ebb and flow of numbers of children uh, in the area. It is, yeah. Uh, and that's a, it's a real, I think, challenge to try and keep up with that and attend to that, but then also make sure that all of our ministries and programs have uh, the right scale mm-hmm. to make that happen. Yeah. yeah, people church differently now than they did. Yeah. And they may church differently in the future. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell us more about this, how people church <laughs> as well, far as attending and being a part of things. You know, it, things have changed in that 30 years ago, I recall that the church was the centerpiece, the social centerpiece of, of yeah. everybody's lives. Sure. And that's changed. I mean, so uh, many of the events that we had were uh, were uh, built around our Sunday school classes, a hope class, a seekers class, grain class. They would have, everybody would have their Christmas parties here. We'd have ice cream socials. Yeah. We would have dances. We had skits. Um, yeah. And that's changed a bit. We, you know, we still get a lot of people coming to the church, but but it's changed a bit. Yeah, and I think part of what's we were chatting the other day while mm-hmm. you were while you were washing a bus, 
<laughs> imagine that, uh, about some of those changes. And part of what you see as far as like church trends, as far as people's attendance for sort of mainline Protestant church, mm -hmm. um, is that uh, many of our older adults are still here every single Sunday. And if they're not here in their seat, we sort of got to go check on them. Mm -hmm. uh, when that happens, we have a, some stories of, of two gentlemen who sat in front of one of our much beloved church members who was out. And so they just called her and said, hey, you okay? And it uh, turns out she was okay, but was sick. And so just that sort of checking in on people. But for a lot of people, sort of in my demographic, when I started the uh, new Parents with Young Children Sunday School class, which is a great class for anybody looking for a Sunday School class with young children, uh, I told them, I'll see you every fourth or fifth Sunday. Right. Uh, because after the pandemic, things we learned from the pandemic that are helpful is that we want to see our grandparents. We want to see our family. Absolutely, because we didn't get to see everybody as much as we might have liked to. Uh, also, if you have young kids and you made it through a pandemic, helping them go to school and you working, uh, you get that part of things. And so, if a kid's sick or you're traveling for work, we'll, we'll see you that fourth Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so, part of that trend is real. And that was happening before the pandemic. Uh, but also, it's because there are so many things now that happen sort of on top of Sunday school hour, sports and activities for kids. Um and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it makes people have to make some choices. Uh, and many of those choices are seasonal. If you're on travel ball team, well, you have to travel on Sunday because that's when the team is playing. Mm -hmm. And so you have to go in knowing that. Part of why we have the Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday midweek communion service is to offer people some of those opportunities for worship that are not just on Sunday morning. So a lot of people come, uh, especially if they're following UGA football around or they're <laughs> going Yeah, I heard to, they do that. Go, yeah. yeah, I've heard they do that, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, then sometimes they'll come if they know they're going to be out on a Sunday. Well, they'll come for Wednesday. And that's a way so we can stay in that pattern of worship. Um, and so it really is sort of a different way of thinking about what church is and how it functions in our lives. I think it's still very important for many people it just happens to be less of a weekly rhythm and more of a monthly rhythm mm -hmm. or an episodic rhythm. And I don't have a lot of uh, uh, beef or upsetness about that. I think that's just how things are. It just That's the way it is. And so when we as a church uh, have always sort of seen some of that coming, one of the things that we do as a church well is we're not just in the building, that we understand the neighborhood, that we work with the local food pantry, that we do all of these things. And one of the things that I was glad to be a part of when I was here, Pastor Glenn Etheridge asked me if I would help to be on the team to build an inclusive playground. Mm -hmm. What's an uh, inclusive playground? Yeah. So, an inclusive playground is a playground made for kids with disabilities that their typical friends could also play in. Mm -hmm. So, great question. We always get asked, inclusivity, uh, that you build something with people with disabilities in mind. And then, uh, the typical kids can use it too. Mm -hmm. So, the joke is, why build stairs when you can build a ramp? Because then it is normal. Everybody can use it, right? right. Everybody mm -hmm. can. Uh, so, that's, that's part of it. Now, um, before we had the inclusive playground, there was a big old park over there. Mm -hmm. Just a big green space that had some plans uh, waiting, lying in wait for it. And so, we built the Etheridge Inclusive Playground, named after uh, Pastor Glenn and his wife, Kathy, uh, who was my daughter's special education music teacher for a number of years at Coralwood. Uh, and they wanted to have this playground in this space. And so, uh, it now functions as sort of some of that neighborhood busyness. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and you live right next to it. So I know And on a <laughs> Saturday morning, there's plenty to eat out there. There's always two or three birthday parties. Sure, sure. A couple of hundred kids. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a party place. Well, and the green space itself is a nice thing for families, for kids learning to play soccer. Absolutely. Uh, for family reunions. We have all these things. Now, as, as a note, anytime someone's wanted to use it for a party or for a celebration, we want them to notify us with an intent to use. Because, for example, if we've already have two birthday parties booked at 1030 and 1130, we don't need to have a fourth and fifth one show up unannounced uh, in that space. Uh, but if you have questions about that, you can go on the church website at ogmc.org slash playground, or you can just simply read one of the signs in the playground that tells you how to uh, let us know of your intent to use the space. And uh, no one can reserve it because we still want it to be available for anyone who mm -hmm. wants to come and play, hence the inclusivity. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a big part of, of doing that and helping people uh, – love that area and that space, and have more ways to be together. Mm -hmm. I think it's really a beautiful thing. Uh, we knew it would be busy. We didn't know it would be that busy. I had no idea. <laughs> so, none of us did. You know, the only thing I would say about going forward is just back to the future. I, uh, there's going to be a time when my kids are out of the house, which is now, and mm -hmm. I'm too old to live here, and we're going to get a <laughs> new group of family with kids, and we're going to rinse and repeat, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I think that will be a part of how the neighborhood continues to uh, continue some of the same things about the mm -hmm. importance of family, 
whether it's in a newly constructed modern house or in a brick ranch like mine mm -hmm. uh, that's from the 50s and 60s, I still think there will be that continual desirability for the neighborhood and people wanting to be a part of a, a neighborhood that feels like an actual neighborhood and community. I agree. And it's important that we're flexible to everybody's changing needs, you know? I've been I have been blown away by the work honestly that you've done. You can cut that if you want or not, but uh, you are the perfect person at the perfect time in the perfect place to do that. Well, it, you could not deal with inflexibility right now. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point that uh, part of all of us on staff as church members and, and mm -hmm. especially folks leading ministries and opportunities is to be flexible and understand that things are different now than they were. Now, any change is perceived as loss, as death. So, all the stages of grief happen around change. Anytime there's a big change or little changes that sort of accumulate, mm -hmm. and you look back and you see, well, that's different. There's not much we can do to change how it's different in society. Um, and there are opportunities it presents us to be present with people wherever they might be. Um, I have friends, I, I share this often about the playground, uh, my neighbors who are Hindu, who celebrate Diwali, uh, my neighbors who are Sikh or Buddhist or Muslim or who are not interested in religion, uh, they still... And they joke with me that this is their church mm -hmm. <laughs> because they love the playground and their kid goes to school here and they come for Boy Scouts here. And so, so it's still, even though they're not interested specifically in the religious aspects of our uh, faith in Jesus Christ here, they see the ministry we do as a way that helps them belong to this neighborhood. And the cover of our bulletin not too long ago listed mm. all of the outside non-church groups we have in here yeah that enjoy the space and we like to service and i think yeah. it's fantastic yeah and that's just gonna grow yeah and i think that'll be a big part of when we have that reputation reputation in the neighborhood mm -hmm. as a church that helps do those things then more people say well yeah you should ask oak grove mm -hmm. and we have garden clubs neighborhood associations uh uh av and sound groups don't and i know uh, it yeah yeah we have all these different groups that use our spaces well and lovingly uh from disability ministries that work with people with disabilities uh, also again scouts is a huge user of our space and a huge way to be a part of the neighborhood uh, we have all these groups that find oak grove to be a hospitable place mm -hmm. Uh, and in large part uh, due to your work and helping it. We uh, love to welcome. Space. I mean, this is my home. I want you to come in the house. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Carl, for being a part of the conversation and the podcast. Thanks for asking uh, me. For letting me ask you to be on film and on the podcast. You did great. You did great. Thank you. Well, uh, friends, thank you for watching the podcast and being a part of this. Uh, if this is interesting for someone you might know, uh, share this episode or another one. Send them a link on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you might take in your podcast. And enjoy it. Uh, I know that it'll wind up on your feed pretty soon, and you'll have to listen to yourself on the podcast. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I try to, and it's it's hard sometimes still. Uh, well, thank you, Carl, for being on the podcast. Uh, appreciative of you and uh, as a colleague, friend, brother, and, uh, yeah, co-worker here in this delightful place. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right. Well, friends, we'll see you next week in the next episode as we talk with our friend David Sullivan, the man in the yellow hat who we see walking around the neighborhoods, who I met happened to be walking around uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so more about him and about his connections with Kingsbridge and our church community and just the neighborhood as we continue this podcast. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.